Dear God, I heard preaching last night about national revival, about the passionate and faithful prayers of your people. And we heard how you moved in a powerful way a long time ago. We would love to see you do that again today in America. We believe that you can. We know that you can. Please help us. Revive us again, O oh Lord. As I think about revival history, my heart is stirred by how you miraculously worked in the days of yesteryear. Your word is filled with your power and the promise of revival. Please turn our hearts to you, O oh God. Cause your face to shine upon us. We long for a mighty manifestation of your presence. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We've read about revivals from eyewitness accounts and old books. We've heard the wonderful stories of days gone by, the tent revivals, times when men had to stop preaching because of how dynamically you moved into a service. We stand in awe of what you've done. Arenas packed, altars and aisles flooded with people getting saved or getting right with you. You did all of this, and we believe that you can do it again. We desire to see thy power and thy glory. God, you're a consuming fire. How you moved in Wales in 1904 and shook the world. We desperately need your touch today. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. We know that you're not limited by time and space, but you are limited by our hesitant unbelief and sin. Forgive us. Convict us of our pride and apathy. Tear down the walls of ritualism and indifference. Help us to radically get right with you and be genuinely broken over our sin that grieves your presence and quenches your power. We surrender our lives for the cause of revival and the sake of the gospel. Please, God, do a mighty work in this generation and the one to follow. Only then 
will it become possible to accomplish wonders? To become who you were meant to be? Arise. Corinthians chapter number 10, in case you thought we were getting more preaching from the Lord. Find out with all the things we need to do. I feel pressure to cut my time short and make sure I get through. I don't like pressure, so I decided not to let my time get out of the way. Jim, let's start with you. It's going to be a long service because I didn't want to. First Corinthians chapter number and if you're located there, would you stay with me, please, and honor the God's Word, as is our custom here at the Anchor Baptist Church. And I'll read out loud. We'll start at verse number 6. I will read out loud. You read silently along with me, but we will read together. First Corinthians chapter number 10, starting at verse number 6. Now, these things were our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also must, neither be uh, idolaters. As were some of them, as it's written, the people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up before them. Verse number eight. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt God, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Verse eleven. Now all these things happen to them. For example, they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are coming. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Verse, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Father, thank you. Please help your people tonight, please. And strengthen them for days that are coming. All the things that you have taught us from even beginning things before we got saved, we did not know that. Now, that you are all 
already strengthening and teaching, wanting to use us, setting us aside, sanctifying us for your particular use. May we all find that place and find it quickly. We're running out of time. I pray tonight, dear Lord, that we would use these things as our example as we fall into the same problem that these people fall into. Bless the dear folks tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes does it seem too good to be true that God's only Son lived and died just for you? Is it hard to believe that His love was really there? In spite of your sin, He continues to care. I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior he is. I don't know where your feet have taken you, but his kind of Calvary still is. I don't know what kind of words you've spoken, but his words were, Father, forgive. I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior you are. Sometimes does it seem you've wandered so far You'll never get back to that place in his heart Don't you know that he waits for the sound of your prayers Just whisper his name and you'll know that he's there I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior he is. I don't know where your feet have taken you, but his kind of Calvary's hill. I don't know what kind of words you've spoken, but his words were, Father, forgive. I don't know what a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior is. What we are is not what matters, but what he is to us. Who we are is not important, but whom we choose to trust. I don't know. What a sinner you are, but I know what a Savior he is. I don't know where your feet have taken you, but he's climbed up Calvary's hill. I don't know what kind of words you've spoken, but his words were, Father, forgive. I don't know. What a sinner you are, and I know what a Savior he is. Yes, I know what a Savior he is. Thank you, man. 
things together. In my first Corinthians chapter number 10, we have a lot of ground to cover. First Corinthians chapter number 10. We'll go back there if you will. Turn your Bible, find it once again. Matthew, Mark, and John, actually, up in the first Corinthians. Turn there, find chapter number 10. Look at our text verse, verse number 13. I want to pull something out of verse 13 here in just a moment. We'll talk extensively, though, about this verse. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Why doesn't God stop this preacher? He knows I can't take it. This isn't right, preacher. No one's going through what I'm going through. How much of a load does God expect me to bear up under? You guys that's right. I just can't resist the lust, the sin that was set before me. I was pushed too far. I had to carry too much. That is why I failed. We heard statements like this. In fact, you made one of statements yourself. Statements of hopelessness, helplessness. Surrender to sin, seeing that it was so unfair, unbearable. Uncommon. Nobody else has gone through what we've gone through. Nobody knows the trouble that I've seen. You've heard people make these types of statements. Though I would not attempt to tell you that I know what you're going through. I'm not going to guess that because I don't know. You don't know what I've gone through. We can all make those types of statements, but I really don't know. I'm not going to pretend that I personally have gone through something you've gone through because we're all different. But I will refute several facts about such statements. Here's one of those things I will refute. First of all, it's not peculiar to you. It is common to all men. Whatever you're going through is common to all men. Now, it may not be common to that one, but it's common to a half a dozen people around the world or more. Number two, if you're going through it, you're able to bear it. For God would not allow it in your life to begin with. Just like Job, you said, well, the devil set that whole thing up. No, actually, God invited it. Because he knew Job, if he made the right decisions, could bear that. He knew that. Number three, you are able to bear it. Yes, you are. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever you have gone through, or whatever you're going to face, you are able to bear it because God said, listen to me now, listen to me now. You're able to do that. Number four, there is a way to escape. But doesn't that sound like a, like a contradiction of terms? And it's to say that you're able to bear it and there's a way to escape. Now, to me, I'm thinking, if there's a way to escape, I don't want to bear it. Why do I have to bear it if there's a way to escape? It just doesn't make sense. So what happens, one would think that if I could escape, why would I do it? Because you misunderstand the Scripture, which happens a lot. So I want to talk to you tonight about a way to escape. A way to escape. You can't get off the plane if you want one way to do that. And I would not suggest you take your own life. That's not a good way to go. So I want to talk to you about several things here tonight, and then we'll wrap it all up. Our text verse is prefaced by 12 other verses that actually explain verse number 13. In the explanation of those verses, it is telling us about the character of a man on how he time and time again kept messing up, kept blowing it, falling into sin, turning against God. Time and time again, these verses ahead of time. For example, in verse number 6, we are warned not to follow their example. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 6. We are warned. We are warned because of something they did. No, that was them. This is us. God said, no, you're all basically the same. That's why the God can actually say, for all that sin and come short of the glory of God. You didn't sin like me, but you sinned. I didn't do what you did, but we all did something. So when God's talking about mankind, he's talking about you. He's talking about me. So we find out in verse number 6, we are warned not to follow their example. So God put all of this in. Only a father like God would tell on his own kids and say, okay, look at some of my kids, what they did. We wouldn't do that. We want everybody to think our kids are perfect. They're little devils, and you know they are. But we want everybody to think that, and, and they drive us crazy. We don't want to do it half the time. But only God would say, let me, let me tell you about Peter. You know, he stuck his foot in his mouth how many times? You know, I told him one day that he's going to be sick to this week. You know what he told me? It ain't going to happen. He talked right back. Only God would talk about his own kids like that. Verse number 7. It tells in verse number 7, they turned from God and served other gods. Now, I want to tell you something. That's common to man. Even Christians do that. 
Anything other than God being the God to lead and guide your life is a God in your life. You can become your own God. People do it all the time. I don't mean you set up an, an, an idol for yourself other than you become your idol. You're saying, I know what I want. I know how to lead me. I know what I'm doing. I can figure this out. That's God. That's what God does. So basically, you're sidestepping God. You turn from God to serve other gods. Look in verse number 7 also. They went back to enjoying the pleasures of the world. Come on. How many Christians have we seen do that? They're serving the living God. They get a little fed up, a little bored. Things don't turn out the way they want to. By the way, all of this is common to me. This is not peculiar to you. You, 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 X and Z and zero generation. Probably more the last one than anything else. The zero generation. Uh, everything's about you. Everything's about your feelings. Everything's about what you want. Uh, why do I need to do this? Why do I have to go through this? Why don't you... Do Verse number eight, they committed fornication. Whoa, a lot of that going on. But that's common to man, is it not? Verse number nine, they tempted God by foolishly challenging him. Why didn't God do something? How about you're challenging God? Like when they said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? The Bible said it made God angry. Because they tempted God, what they were saying was, we're putting you to the test. You don't put God to the test. The only place that I know you can do that is in Malachi. It has to do with you giving tithes and offerings. Well, I guess you're going to pay attention to that. In verse number 10, they murmured and complained. Isn't it amazing in our society? We don't think just speaking our mind. I don't like it. Why is why is it? That's murmuring and complaining. Sulking, pouting, call it what you want to know. But the fact of the matter is, the children of Israel never suffered more over any one thing than murmuring and complaining. Here they were coming out of Egypt after 400 years of being in slavery, God providing everything for them. One day Moses was, was trying to figure some things out, and the Bible said every man was in the door of his tent complaining, murmuring, and complaining to Moses. Every man was in the door of his tent. Now, we don't have tents here. So we go home and shut the door. So I want you to notice several things in verse number 10. They remember, by the way, all of this is common to man. I want you to keep that in mind. All of this is common to man. I want you to notice in verse number 6, it says, our example about us. In verse number 6 also, it says, we should not. In verse number 7, it says, neither be ye. So he's talking about them to us on what we should or should not be. In verse number 8, neither let us. In verse number 9, neither let us. In verse number 10, neither murmur ye. In verse number 11, and they are written for our admonition. The people of the Old Testament were not super-duper saints or super-duper sinners. You know what they were? Human beings. They fell into the same traps and the same problems that you and I do all the time. And that's why God said, did you see how I responded to them? Do you see how they acted? Okay, now you, you pay attention to that. This is written down for your admonition, for your teaching, for you to study, for you to see in your life. Different faces, different names, different languages, different different locations on the planet, but the same type of people. Same type of people. Don't think you're that different. See, all things are common. Things are common. I've got two people in here, I believe, right now. At least two people that picture me. That's becoming pretty common. You know what's, what's cool about that? They can actually go online now. Some of you already know this because you're super duper uh, computerized and uh, bought into the world stuff, right? And they can actually, my, my father in law, I think, had a pacemaker. Did he? No, who did? Somebody else? Oh, well, these two guys up here in the front. Okay. And what they will do is actually they'll, they'll, they'll go online and they'll go, oh, Miss Usher, uh, you're about to have to beat off. Or do I need to come? No, 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 we'll take care of it from the office. Oh, okay, someone's better now. Isn't that weird? Who ever thought we'd get to that place? But it's becoming common to man. It's not weird anymore. It's becoming common to man. All these things are common to man. Things like these really bother us. The things that are common to men really bother us. They affect us and they, 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 they tempt us. Your 
You say, you're risen above that preacher. These kinds of things don't bother me anymore. I'm sorry. The Bible says here in verse number 12, take heed lest you fall. In verse number 12 it says, wherefore let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. So this isn't you. This is this, 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 he's not describing you. He's describing everybody else but you. Well, what he is describing is in verse number 12, let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. You know what he's saying? If this isn't you, you're the one getting ready to fall. So he's talking to us. God has established we are all basically the same. You may be stronger in one area, they're weaker in another area. They may be weaker in one area, they're stronger in another area. But basically we are all the same. So then we all are tempted by something. Amazing how we sit in church. Like I've never seen since I started breathing, you know. Uh, I was separated from my mother's womb, which is true. I mean, I'm uh, perfect from my mother's womb. And it just, it was, oh no, I never seen, I never have a dirty thought. Liar, liar, case on fire. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yeah, yes, you do. Well, but people don't need to know that. No, but God is saying, I can know that. And it is common to me. It's just common to me. That's just the way that it is. So we are all tempted by something, but no matter what it may be, understand and know there is a way to escape. And it's common to me. But I want you to understand, or God wants you to understand, there is a way to escape. Now, you know how much I like definitions. So you read it on verse 13. Why you look at these verses? I'm going to give you definitions real quick for it, and then I'm going to put them all together for you. Verse number 13 reads like this. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is, here's our word, common to me. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted uh, uh, above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Temptation means adversity. It means evil solicitation. You ever see these people with, on the door saying, you're soliciting? Look at the guy's door one day, his whole door had listings on it. He just had a plaque there. I mean, down this side, down there, down this side, there, and all the way down this side, clear to the ground. And then in the middle, had a big block that if I miss something, I'm talking to you too. He didn't want anybody coming by his door. He said, Preacher, what'd you do? I knocked on his door. What'd you want me to do? I wouldn't get that down and go to hell that nobody tell me. And so I think that temptation means adversity. So when the Bible's talking about temptation in this verse, it's talking about adversity. You know what adversity is. It's talking about evil solicitation, where you go like this. I don't want to do that, it, and it just keeps pulling on you, evil solicitation. Common means, ready for this, this is deep, why don't you make it back to it? Common to man. That's deep, why don't you get any end of the Greek that one? Then he said, the word tempted. Tempted here means tested. Tested, examined, proved. Then he uses the word able. Able means can do. I like that word. It means could do. So you can do, you could do. Then he uses the word temptation again. I'm going to put all this together in a second, so don't let me lose you here. It's all recorded somewhere uh, in the cloud. Temptation still means, here again, it's used twice, it still means adversity or evil solicitation. Then it says escape. Escape means there's an exit. Escape means that there is an end to it. And then it says bear it. You know what bear it means? Bear it underneath. The escape is not get out from under. The escape is bearing under. Not the kids out there. Let's be careful. To bear underneath. So let's put it all together. You ready? Look at your verse. Look at the verse. Number 13. You ready? Look at verse 13. There has no adversity or evil solicitation that's other than common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tested, examined, or proved. Then he goes on, he says, that you are able, that you can do, you could do this. Then he says, will with the temptation, with the adversity, will the evil solicitation also make a way to exit or get out from under it. Bear it means to hold up underneath of it. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought all this stuff was common to man. It is. But you just said that there's a way to escape, and, but I have to bear up underneath of it, and, and, and evil solicitations, and, and, but all this stuff's common. I don't get it, preacher. I just don't get it. The reason is, we don't understand what the verse is trying to say. We fuss with this all the time. You just don't realize it. So did you get what he was saying? 
Did you understand what he was trying to say? It still doesn't sound right somehow to me because he's saying you will be solicited. These things are going to happen to you. These things were written for your admonition. These things were written so you don't follow after they, what they did. And now if you think you're an exception, wherefore let him that think that he stands take heed lest he fall. Then we go to verse number 13. And he said, but there is no temptation taking you but such as common man. It's common. It's common to man. So what do we have? This test that's being allowed, whether it's adversity in your life or evil solicitation, so that Christians eventually say they cannot take it, God says, bear it, because he's provided a way to escape. Escape means to bear up underneath of it. Escape means to go under. It means to endure you said, Preacher, how can I escape? I thought the escape, now you tell me I have to take it. Yes. But I thought you said I could escape. Yeah. He said, Okay, now you just talk down on both sides of your face. No. He said that you may be able to bear it. Part of the escape is to bear it. The other part is to allow Christ to come under it with you. We not only do not want to to bear it, we do not invite Christ in under helping us lift that load so that we can endure it. Listen very carefully. The escape is not from the trials of life that are common to man. You can, look, it's zero generation. Listen to me. It's a new phrase. I just turned it because I'm not going to read this. Zero generation. I'm talking to you. You keep trying to escape every discomfort and dislike. It's common to man. God says it. It's just common man. Trials, heartaches, burdens, uh, uh, hurts, tears, avoiding lust of temptation and life's pressures. These are common to all men. Face it. Understand, it's common to all men. You're just going to have to endure some things. Where are the men nowadays? You, you, dear ladies, what you really should do is say, he handles things, I'll go along with him. The problem is, Look, we've got ladies that are going off to college come back with zero. We've got ladies that didn't have one date in the Bible college filled with 3,000 men. You know why? They weren't men, they were boys. Real women don't want to marry boys. I mean, after a while, what choice do you have? So what happens here? These are common to men. But watch what he says. But will with the temptation, not without the temptation, but with the temptation, also make a way of escape. These things, you cannot escape. You cannot escape heartache. You cannot escape tears. You cannot escape temptation. You cannot escape heartache. You cannot escape burden. You cannot escape test. These are a part of life. Sooner or later, they will come to you, and probably more often than you care to think about. But you can't escape from falling because of those things. If you bear it, you're fine. If you bear it, you're fine. Let's not say one more time. If you bear it with Christ. If you don't, there's only two things on why all Christians sooner or later will fall. You decided I'm not bearing it. You left God out first. So you're kind of on your own. The escape is Christ. Most Christians don't bear up under it. Most Christians fail or fall under the burden. Most Christians yield to a constant temptation because they believe the way of escape is to get out from underneath the trial. That's not what that's teaching at all. He's saying, we'll with the temptation, with the temptation, with it, make a way of escape. Two things. Number one, you're going to have to just bear it. God is trying to strengthen you for things that are still coming. The other thing is, God said that you're not going to make it because you don't have the strength you need without me. So let me get underneath it. They're with you. How can how, how to escape? God is faithful, the Bible says. God is faithful. You're not. God is faithful. I said, you let me underneath it. I promise you, I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be right there with you. So you have to understand something. Go to Matthew chapter number 11 very quickly. Matthew chapter number 11, in verse number 28. You can't, you can't, folks, listen. Zero generation, old generation, middle generation, generations, listen. 
you cannot, it is impossible for you to escape heartache, burdens, troubles, tears, children going bad, churches splitting. All these things are things that are common to men. They're common. Every preacher thinks, all oh, those poor other preachers, they don't know what they're doing. You know, my first five years of building this church, I didn't have not one family, not one person left. Everybody who joined said, I thought, boy, that's a small family. Well, my sixth year was a kind of experience. Because every month for one year, I had another family left. And they said, what was he doing wrong? You'd make a great pastor. By the way, there were some things I was doing. Well, I was going to talk about the Holy Spirit. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Watch, watch. You cannot escape these things. But the way to escape the destruction of these things is to bear it with him who is faithful. To bear it with him who is faithful. Look at Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labor, labor, and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He's talking about while you're laboring, while you are bearing this burden, I will give you rest in the burden. He didn't say, I'll take you out from that and you'll feel a whole lot better. He said, no, you let me come in on that. You let me have that. You come to me. You, all of that, that labor and heaven, I will give you rest. Rest in the burden. You've never seen a person broken hearted and smiling and helping other people. That's what they're talking about. You see somebody at a funeral and heart is just breaking and they're actually comforting other people. He said, I hope you'll always be okay. God will take care of that. You know what they did? They decided to bear it and also allow God underneath of that with them. And God said, that's the way it's going to work. He did not say he'd take away the burden, but give you rest in the burden. Go to Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter number 9. There's a lot of verses we misunderstand in the Bible. Like this one. When you decide to set out to make yourself happy, to find your own way, to make yourself what you think you deserve, you're going to lose your life. You'll lose the purpose of your life. You'll lose the understanding of why God created you put you here. However, if you will lose your life, I'm not talking about getting suicide. I mean, if you'll let your people matter, don't think it matters. You see, he said, now you're going to figure it out. Now it makes sense. See, we're going about this all wrong. What we really need to do is say, I don't matter. You know what we're saying today? But I matter. I, I, I have a mind too. Well, I have a life too. So the whole time we keep trying to find ourselves, we can't figure out what this is all about. God says, if you quit trying to find yourself and side with me, you'll find out what your life is all about. A Christian fully sold out to God is the happiest person you'll ever run into. But I know a couple of miserable millions. You can joke all you want. Well, at least you're miserable in the better part of town. Ha, 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 ha. Isn't that funny? Isn't that hilarious? If we would go after Christ and live in Christian life like the way we do money and business, we'd be the happiest people ever. So watch what he says in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse number 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up, oh, that doesn't sound good. Let him take up his cross. How often? David. It's not going to stop. You keep looking for an end road while you're still living. It's not it's going to work that way. He said, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Bear it for Christ. Bear it for God. Be, be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Be a good soldier. He didn't say be a good pansy. He didn't say be a good sissy. He didn't say be a good defender. He said be a good soldier. Boy, I wish the military turned out men again. I can't, I can't believe what they're doing. I hate to shock you to your sandals, but the fact of the matter is, now you can hold up a little card that says, I'm under too much stress. I need a break. And the drill sergeant has to let you have a break. I can tell you what they broke when I was in there. He said, well, that's what was wrong with it. Yeah, well, check out the thing. You know, even China is changing their teaching of their boys. You know what they noticed? Skinny jeans and mullets. They're turning out effeminate little boys. So unlike America, 
which we're kind of for that because we like really feminine boys. That, that, that make us that make the women feel so masculine. Then why would you want that? It is not how do I do it, how do I escape, or how do I get from underneath this load of a husband that won't serve God with me. That is common to men. It is not how do I escape one of those that, that I love won't, won't, won't forgive my sin and my mistake. That is common to men. It is not how do I escape and get out from underneath the load of living with this feeling that I had as an abused child, or a son or a daughter that has gone bad, or my financial struggles or being kicked out of college or high school, or an illness that plagues my body. How do I escape this? The physical handicap of a child, a divorce or a looming divorce, parents that will not get along. How do I escape that? Quit because I've cheated on my spouse. I'm facing guilt. I think I just need to run away. I need to find a new place to live. How do I, how do I stop all this? That's what we're looking for. Carrying the burden of dozens of other families and teenagers and bus kids. Preachers do that all the time. All the time. Not just their own family, but all of you. You do understand. You ain't, sir, look, you're going to answer for your family. I don't care how liberated she thinks she is. God holds you responsible for your family. On the other hand, he holds me responsible for everybody that's part of the church. That's a little weird. Times it is pretty How do I face it? God said, Preacher, when you're a part of the church, you're chosen. And let me get you to the issue. That is your escape from the destruction of things that are common to all men. Constantly being tempted to lust in my mind and my body. Not asking you to amen. I already know. I should have heard an arousing amen. I know that. The trap is not the burden, the heartache, the tears. The escape is not that. You can't escape that stuff. You can't escape it. We're trying desperately to escape what you cannot escape. You have to simply look at it and say, God, I will take that. And all I do it with you, I can do that. Listen to me. You have to start trusting Him. Why? All the titles. Your Jehovah Witness friends are absolutely wrong if you happen to have any of those. Jehovah is not his only true name. There are dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of proper names given to our God because he is so vast and so hard to describe in a name. He gives us many names. For example, refuge, rock, shield, master, father, deliverer, buckler, fountain, meat, door, our bread of life, the way of life, the truth, sustainer, captain, potter, great physician, the beginning and the end, creator, strength, God, Shadow, shelter, the great I am, the Holy One, the only one, the God of all, omniscient, um, omnipotent, omniscient, King of kings, Lord of lords, Savior, only me, only mediator, advocate, shepherd, vine, high tower, King of glory, bridegroom, uh, line of the tribe of Judah, on and on and on. That's why God said, if you let me in on things, you just decide to take it and let me get in on that. He never asked you to walk along. He never told you to take it, and I'll show up when I can. He said, the only time I don't show up is when you won't let me show up. He's always there. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So what in God's dear name are we doing facing all this on our own? But we will. I'll figure it out somehow. How can we escape the burdens, the tears, the weariness, the heartaches, the temptations, the pressures of the weekend? You say, that's the good news? When you come to that conclusion, you may start finding the good news. All of these things and many, many more are just common men. They're just common men. You will go through all of these things and probably multiple times. And you came back. Look at me. You can hold up underneath it. You can undergo the hardships. The escape is Christ. We keep thinking the escape is removed. We'll get a different life. 
to tell the kids to go. To tell, what, we can think that. That's not the answer. The answer is, bear it. Let me get you from the church. Don't run from Christ. Run to Christ. Don't run from church. Listen to me. Quit quitting church. Quit skipping church. You do understand this is the body of Christ. He, he promised eternal perpetuity to this place, to his church. If there's any safe place in the world, it is in a local Baptist church that's preaching the truth. I went to preach a good preaching. I like it. Don't run from the Word of God. Run to the Word of God. Don't run from soul when it's run through soul. Winning. Don't run from forgiving. Quit trying to find an excuse on why you don't have to forgive. Just forgive and let God handle everything else. A Christian is saved by bearing it with Christ. So, preacher, I'll be back when I figure things out. You'll never escape that way. But you just decided I'm not going to bear it because I didn't ask Christ. It never worked. But I'm able to handle the sadness and the hurt. You'll see me again, preacher. Yes, you're right. You must go through something. It's common to man, but you're not going to bear it. Because you decided not to bear it, and you forgot, I didn't ask Christ to help you. So you're not going to make it. Preacher, my heart busted. I just want to lay down and dump it. Over 32 years, it's more irrelevant than ever before. I'm a late bloomer and catch my head on the And the struggle and the loss and the devastation that people have brought on is amazing. Great loss in this room. Devastation in this room. Have you ever been that place where you actually felt part of the room that you were so close to? Have you ever been to the place that when you went to pray, you knew you were supposed to pray? Just come all the way to the Lord. But you come to the Lord. You are the friend of the Lord. You have it. You have it. You believe you can't bear it, don't you? But you see, I, I, I hate you. It's king. Because God who is faithful said, Faith. God who is faithful said, Because I'm faithful, let me come into the Lord. And you'll be able to hold up underneath whatever you have to face. God would not allow it if he could not help it. What kind of a father would that be? What kind of a father would our God be? One of his titles is Father. What kind of a father would he be to allow you to go into something, to call something to come into your life and say, he'll never make it like it, he'll fall down. What kind of a father? He isn't that way. I don't care, ma'am, what you're facing. Sir, I don't care what you're facing. I know you can't catch your breath. I know the tears are falling from your eyes. I know you lose sleep at night. You wonder if anybody cares. Does it matter at all? Yes, it does. You have a God in heaven who is faithful. That is his title. He is faithful. If he said, you can bear this, you decide, and let me come alongside of you, and we're going to be okay. The way to escape allowing it to cause you to do evil, to cause you to worship things you should not in your life, to go whoring into the world. Take Christ by murmuring, complaining, is to escape to Christ. This is why you're tempted to not show up to church if you don't know the Lord. This is why when you're too a preacher, my, my wife and I, we were having it out tonight, and, and she blacked my and uh, so uh, I can't come to church because it's embarrassing. You should have been in church. A way to escape. They put the number one top to Jesus. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom, are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Not one place in the Bible does he say, you're on your own, Not even come close to that. 
tell it to Jesus. Not Jesus take it away, but Jesus, I need you. Maybe you need to change your prayer. Number two, find the truth and hang on to it. Find a personal thing in the Bible. There was a time in my life when, honestly, I thought my Christianity was over with. My future as a pastor would have been over with. I had that in a lot of times. Uh, all these things going on here, but understand, one day I came into my to my apartment way back a long time ago. We lived at 161 to 70. I pulled the sword of the Lord from the mailbox. I threw that stuff down on the couch, fell on my knees, bawling my eyes out. Through all those tears, I looked at that religious periodical, and it said, when in trouble, pray. And I thought to myself, I'm in trouble, but I'm praying. And I begin to read Psalm 50, 15. When in trouble, call upon me, and I shall deliver you. And thou shalt worship me. You'll praise me. Well, here I am. You'd almost think God's Word works. How about getting yourself a personal promise to hang on to? Like, I will never leave thee. Now, whatever happened, what are you leaving church for? How come you're walking out on God? He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So don't be blaming God. God said, I am with you. How about this? I am nigh unto them who have a broken heart. Is your heart breaking? Don't you stare down God. God doesn't work that way. He's not afraid of you, ma'am. I don't care how many eyebrows you lift. God loves you, ma'am. Do you understand that? He loves you more, and the devil's walking you right out the door because you said, I will not take this. This is not fair. If God did not think you could, he would never let you down. He's a preacher. I think I called him. Oh, he could. He'd never gotten out of one of those situations before. I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me. Oh my God. You see, just decided, I'm staying. I need you. Number three, seek instruction from an authority. I'm talking about somebody who's something in my life. And do what they advise. There's a time in my life, at the same time in my life, in my life, in my life, I did not want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. Throw those groceries away so I'm not in my house. I don't have to do it. But it's not that it's not so bad. I'm just saying, you stay. You know what? Some of you know what? You stay. You beg God that you're asking the wrong thing. You're holding Him like you're holding Him to the wall. He better show up and you're going to quit. That'll never work. I've even tried reverse psychology. Saying was, George Bell, you're not quitting. You're staying. Somehow God will get us through this. I don't know how, but we're not walking out on God. And lo and behold, here I am. You have got to determine. I'm going to bear this. God allowed this into my life. These things are common to man. Quit acting like it's just you, like God just hates you. God doesn't hate you, my dear friend. He loves you. Did He not prove that? How many times you got to prove that to you? So you have to understand, ne- by the way, next one, never miss church. Can I tell you how many times people will say, preacher, here's my problem. I just preached on that Sunday night. And you decided, I'm not very this. I'm going to stay home and watch the game. Remember what God has brought you through. Then God will bring you. If God has, Others have been through it and gone through it, and so can you. By the way, a lot of my Christian life, that's, that's kind of a, a, a principle that I live by. I find somebody else, like Job. Aren't we weird? We read Job, suffering makes me feel bad. Maybe the next time you get real bad, go read about Job. You think, that, man, that guy really went through it. I don't feel so bad now. So his suffering made me feel bad. In a way, do you know why some of you suffer? Others around you that will not have met them. They will see you able to do it. Maybe I can't do it. I go through my Christian life that way. Because a lot of things I run into are all firsts. And so I find somebody else and I go, oh, that's real similar to what I'm going through, or worse. And I think 
think to myself, God doesn't love them any more than He loves me. If they're getting through it, I got to find out how they're doing. It. I'm going to do what they're doing. I don't have to quit. I don't have to give in. I don't have to give up. And then number seven, and I'm done. Settle the question of God once and for all. Just said, quit, quit putting God on trial every time you go through a hard Just quit putting God on trial. What am I talking about? The question of God. Number one, God loves you. Get that settled. Don't ever change your mind back. Why is God be quiet? Second, God loves me. God loves all the little children. Red, yellow, black, white, put together, white, and white. God loves all the kids. Red, yellow, black, and green, put together, white, and green. You know those songs. God loves you. God is good. Even when God does evil, it's good for what He does. You've got to get the same thing. Either God is always good, either God is always going to love you, or He's not. But if you don't know, you expect for it. What I'm going to is allowed by God to be this way. You know? You know, even the devil can't do what he wants by God to mess with you. But God must trust you a lot, too. God must trust you a lot. Say, if you will, to the devil, they won't pray on you. But they'll do the test. And God is saying, and compare them. Now, first of all, the devil has nothing to do. This is clearly the same thing. So, what I want you to do is decide I'm going to bear this for the Lord. And I need you to be with me. If you do that, you're going to be up. And then finally, on this thing about the set of the question. Therefore, I will not want to. I don't necessarily need to understand. I just need to know that God loves me. I know that God is good. I know that God could stop me from saying to people that the way I'm going to is the good thing to say. A way to escape. 